is it filming? I think so. Okay, well I'm gonna go for it. Hello, aspiring psychologists. My name is Miranda and I am a soon to be, nearly, second year trainee clinical psychologist. Today's subject is how to write a good application for the clinical psychology doctorate. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my experiences of taking my application from zero to hero. So, to give you the backstory, I applied for the doctorate twice. The first time round was a total disaster. I got three flat out rejections, which was painful. And then the fourth one, I did manage to get onto the reserve list for interview, but that also ended in distinct tragedy story for another time. Second time round though, it was like night and day. I got three interview offers right off the bat and then the fourth one, I made it onto their reserve list, all of which translated into me getting a place and fulfilling my potential. So what was different, I hear you ask? Well, kind of nothing about me as a person. So my applications were only one year apart. I hadn't got a new job no new promotion, I hadn't got any new qualifications, my references were from exactly the same people, one of them being from my undergrad days. The only thing that was vastly different was what I'd written on the application form about myself and where I'd sent it. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what I think made the difference. I'm gonna address each of the four main written components of the application separately, tell you how I approached it differently the second time round and give you some of my top tips along the way because I'm generous like that. So, without further ado, on to question one. Okay, so if you're anything like me, this is where panic sets in, writer's block consumes you, and you are filled with this impending sense of doom. My advice for you here would be to write like a person, not like a robot. I think it's fair to say that in my first year, the pressure seriously got to me. Like, I kind of crumbled. It honestly took me about four months to write this first question because I was just so overwhelmed with it all. I think what happened was I'd got very consumed with all the selection criteria, the clinical competencies and all these other imagined tick boxes that kind of go round the rumour mill of the aspiring psychology world of things that you might probably kind of never need to get onto training. And I spent my 3,000 characters trying to show that I had it all that I just, I had everything. I was trying to paint myself as this academic research and clinical god, which would have been a stretch now, but was a huge stretch back then. And I was name dropping job titles, organizations, therapeutic approaches, anything that I thought would make the reader go tick, tick, tick. But in doing so, I ended up producing something that was actually very, very generic. So my second year, I kind of thought to myself, okay, there are some seriously exceptional candidates out there, and I mean creme de la creme exceptional. Like in my year alone, I think there's four candidates who arrived onto the doctorate already being doctors. <coughs> like they're just going to be double doctors by the time the three years is out, which isn't at all intimidating. And in realising that, I made peace with the fact that I'm a very average applicant. That's not to put myself down, because I think I'm great. I needed this realisation because it helped me to see that I was unlikely to stand out if I was talking about my experiences on the surface level and trying to pin my application on the fact that I had been an assistant somewhere. So the second time round, I just threw that criteria out the window. I unshackled myself. Instead, I asked myself, who was Miranda as an undergrad? Who is Miranda now? How is this person different and why is this a good thing? In asking myself this question, I ended up writing something that was vastly more personal. I don't think that the specifics are really important here, but just to give you a little flavour. I talked about a pretty enormous failure that I'd encountered on the way to training, which made me readdress things. I talked about an uncomfortable realisation that I'd had about myself, which I also needed to think about. And I talked about my changing perspective of the mental health system. So refraining from trying to guess what I thought people would want to hear was actually really crucial for me. It helped me to sound a little bit more like me. 
So I would say don't be afraid to share your perspective on things. It's really interesting and it's going to be different to everyone else that comes before you. And if people don't find it interesting, then they don't deserve you. So moving on to question number two, everybody's favourite. Oh. So I think my advice here would be, there's more to life than publications. I genuinely, I remember this so clearly the first time around, I found this question so intimidating. I thought that the gold standard here was to be able to talk about publications that had been shared across the globe and translated into seven different languages. And in my case, I had zero publications, I had no masters, a completely irrelevant undergrad thesis and next to no research experience. So first time round, because I thought publications and research is key, honestly, I nearly left this section blank because it was that big a deal to me. In the end, I thought better of it and I tried to cobble together what little researchy, publication-y experience I had and tried to kind of fluff it up a bit. I, I can say that now because I'm on training. But yeah, I tried to fluff it up a bit. And if this sounds a bit unconvincing to you, it's because it was majorly unconvincing. So the second time round, I decided to help myself out and read the question. And it quite clearly says that it's not just about publications, it's dissemination as well. And what is dissemination? It's just the process of sharing knowledge with other people. So I thought about this question really broadly. And actually, in my experience, I'd done a fair amount of teaching and training, I'd done some public speaking, I'd spoken to undergrads about psychology. Okay, fair enough. At no point was I talking about any sophisticated psychological theory, but I was imparting some knowledge. I was spreading the good word about psychology and mental health. And I think with this sort of stuff, all you need to do is show that you've got capacity and that you can think about it. There is more to life than publication, so act accordingly. Moving on to question number three. My advice here would be to think bigger. Just think bigger. So this question was another brain buster for me. I mean, what question wasn't a brain buster for me, to be honest? I think, again, what happened was that the process is so competitive. Like, if you tell anyone that you want to apply for the doctorate, you're sure to be met with, like, oh, it's so competitive, like, you might never get on, rah, 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 rah. And I let all of those nasty, neggy voices get into my head, and I allowed them to crush my hopes and dreams. So I kind of hadn't thought about what life might look like after training because I was genuinely of the opinion that that might never happen. So with this question, I was kind of like, well, what I'll gain from training is that I'll be a clinical psychologist and that's all I could possibly need. So I talked about, you know, like being trained in different therapeutic approaches, becoming a research god and being qualified to be kind to people's minds, which is all a great thing. All of this stuff is completely true, by the way, and very legit. I think if I had to be very self-critical, which I'm really good at, I would say that the course director of whatever course could have told me that I would get that out of training. I kind of hadn't really added anything new to the conversation. So second time round, after I'd got hit in the face with rejection a few times, I kind of thought to myself, like, why do I want this? Like, what could training give me that I don't think I could find in any other profession? So I stopped being embarrassed of this blue sky thinking and actually thought, okay, what aspirations do I have on the other side? In my case, I talked about wanting to be involved in policy change and some of the changes in the mental health system that I'd like to be involved in, which felt ridiculous for someone who had no professional qualifications but I think it was really important because it said something about my values and the kind of clinical psychologist I wanted to be. So now on to question number four. My advice here would be don't try to be Mr or Mrs Universe. And my first time around I really tried to focus on activities which I thought would make me look like Mother Teresa because I thought that's kind of what they would want. So I talked about things like social causes and charities, which is really fantastic, by the way, if that is something that you're really passionate about. But hand on my darkened heart, I hope it's okay to admit this and don't judge me, but I'd kind of got involved in some of these projects because I thought it would look good 
on my application. I think because of that, I talked about them in a very sort of distant PR way. You can tell it, it wasn't the cause that got me going. So the second time round, because I was obviously feeling like I wanted to take some risks, I started to talk about things that you would actually find me doing on my weekends and on my annual leave, keeping it appropriate at all times, of course. And while I wasn't cracking jokes, I was not cracking jokes, I was keeping it formal, but you can definitely see in my writing that I'm excited about the things that I'm talking about. And looking back, I'm kind of happy with this approach because now that I'm on training and I'm learning more about what makes a good clinical psychologist and having worked with lots of great clinical psychologists, one of the characteristics which I think is most important is being able to show yourself as this normal person, as someone who has complexities, has good and bad character traits, has kooky and interesting hobbies. I think that's so important for a you know, a client coming in, it's important to give that message that, that good mental health, success and all of these other wonderful things aren't reserved just for people who are Mother Teresa-like and do saint-like things in their spare time and have everything together. You can be a normal, kind of averagely functioning person and still be doing pretty well. So yay, you've written your application! My final piece of advice would be to get to know your universities. Now I don't want to get too superstitious in this section and I'm very much aware that some of you can't move because of, you know, family, mortgages and just generally not wanting to uproot your life, which is totally fair. But if you can be a little bit flexible, then I personally think it's worth trying to be a little bit strategic about your course choices just to try and tip things ever so slightly in your favour. So the first time round, I kind of just thought, what city would I like to live in? And kind of base my four course choices off that, which is fine. But then the second time round, I felt like that wasn't really quite working for me. And instead I decided to go through the Leeds Clearing House page and the alternative handbook with a fine tooth comb. So trying to understand a little bit more about the selection process for each of the universities, and what successful candidates tended to have in terms of their qualifications and experience. So based on this, I was able to build a short list of courses which I felt were more aligned to me and my strengths. So for example, I have a strong early academic background in terms of my A-levels and first degree. There are courses out there which reward that. I also know about myself that I don't have a lot of research experience and I don't have any postgrad qualifications. And while some courses may deny this, it did feel that there were certain universities which kind of like to see that from their applications. So for me, I prefer to steer clear. I think it's also really important to think about the full selection process, not just the application form, because the uni selection process varies enormously. Like some have a half hour interview, some have a full day of activities. And I think it's important to pick one that you think will help to showcase your talents. Because you know, we don't just want interviews, we want a place. So try and pick something that you think will help you to shine. Like in my case, I was reviewing one university and I saw that it had a full day of fun. And I knew halfway through that I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown and I'm not gonna have a good time. That is just not a good environment for me. I also know that I don't really shine in selection tests, which kind of makes it remarkable that in my first year I picked two unis which had selection tests. On the other hand, I know people who are maybe a little bit fresher out of university that have been able to use selection tests to their advantage. They know that they can smash the life out of selection tests and it helps them to go toe to toe with people who've got more experience than them. It's all about finding something that is going to fit you. Okay, I feel like I've now blabbered on for long enough, so I'm gonna bring you to my final closing comments. So obviously I present this to you knowing full well there's absolutely no formula for success when it comes to the application form. This is just what worked for me, and I hope it can give you a little bit of inspiration, particularly if you're coming back from a bit of a dud round last application season, and you're thinking about how you wanna change things up and approach things differently, hopefully to get a better result. So finally, finally, I just wanna wish you all the best of luck in this year's application season. It is tough out there, so please do look after yourself. And I really hope to welcome as many of you as humanly possible into the trainee family very, very soon. Okay, I feel awkward now. Bye!